Verse 50. Verse 50. Oh, first Timothy. They said verse 50. <laughs> I don't even know. I'm just I need to someone out of here. 1 Timothy 4. Yeah, we'll verse 50, guys. No. Okay. Yeah. This one's verse 50. First. Verse 50. Verse 50. Why should second Timothy? Uh, All right, you recording? Yeah. Okay, so last week we talked about the Word of God, and we've been building this, um, building up that the Word of God is uh, meant to help us understand God, to be able to have a relationship with God, to know how to speak to God, how to talk to God, right? Um, to know God's heart for us to know the plans he has for us, the desires he has for us, uh, the passion he has for us. We also learn that the, the word of God is, is um, sharper than any double-edged sword, right? It's where like a scalpel, it can cut on, I remember seeing that surgery where a doctor cut on some guy's heart, pushed on the heart and a ball of fuzzy, cute little ball of, of cancer came out of his heart, right? And why would a doctor do that? Why would a doctor rip open your rib cage, cut directly on your heart? It's to save your life, right? And that's one of the great things about the Word of God is, is the Bible said also last week that if we persevere in our life and doctrine, we will not only save ourselves, but our hearers, right? It's actually the avenue to know Jesus on how to be saved, right? Let's take it even further today. 2 Timothy chapter 4 says, let's read in verse 14. But as for you, talking to Paul, an older man, Paul, talking to Timothy, training a younger man. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures. Wouldn't that be awesome? Somebody just teaches you as a, Little baby. What verse Good. is that? Verse 14. 2 Timothy 4? Yeah, 2 Timothy 3. Oh, sorry. 2 oh. Timothy 3, verse 14. I'll start with But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through the faith in Jesus Christ. So what does he say that the scriptures are able to make you? Wise. For? Salvation. Salvation in Jesus Christ, right? All scripture, so Paul uses this phrase, all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, and correcting and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for good work. So what does that mean, all scripture is God-breathed? What does that mean? It was created through his nature, through his spirit. He used humans to write it. Yeah, it's finally inspired. When do we see examples of all breed? Creation? I don't know. God created this flesh out of dirt. It was soulless, empty, useless, and God put his mouth right on Adam's nostrils and mouth, and breathe life into him. Jesus did it to the apostles in John chapter 20. The apostles, Jesus went up to them and put his mouth on them, just like the day God did Adam, and breathed the Holy Spirit into them. Do you realize that's what happens when you get baptized? It's as if God is putting his mouth right on you. You're dead, you're useless, you're, you're soulless in the sense of this whole spirit. And when you get baptized, God puts his mouth right on you. It's an intimate thing. The first thing that Adam saw when he woke up was God pulling away from him. Can you imagine Jesus putting his mouth on you and breathing? It's personal. My grandpa, when he, when he was alive, Every time I come to his house, he'd give me a kiss right on the lips. Really awkward, but he wanted me to know that uh, he loved me, right? All scripture is God-breathed. 
important to know that. It says all scripture is God breathed and useful for, a lot of people don't believe that the Bible is useful. It is useful. There's three things that it's useful for. What is it? Teaching, rebuking and correcting and in training and righteousness. So how do you train yourself and how do you train somebody for righteousness? You have to evaluate the situation in your life or somebody else's life, if they're willing to. He starts off with rebuking, and then you correct, and you train in righteousness. So usually, a younger Christian, you start off with some training, right? Helping them know the Bible, helping them know God. And then as they mature more, you correct them a little more, right? You, you, know, you don't want to be rebuking your, your two-year-old all day, like, yeah, you know. But as they get older, think about it. Paul rebuked Peter, right? Right to his face in front of everybody. There's times when we do need to be rebuked. We just need to be wise in when we do it. Correcting and training in righteousness. Are you training yourself in righteousness? Are we training our kids in righteousness? Are we how do you train your kids in righteousness? The word of God. Righteousness is a right relationship with God. So that the man of God may be what? Equipped. Adequate. With completely Adequate. equipped. Thoroughly equipped. Right here. You see that? Let me ask you for what though? Every good work. Every good work. Imagine you went on the football field and you didn't have your helmet. You get pretty jacked up, right? <laughs> And that's what we do as Christians. We go into these battles, we think we know what we're doing. We don't. No, right? helmet. no helmet. Yeah. <laughs> the Bible and the promise here is that Timothy, hey, Timothy, you've been read the scriptures since you were infant. And they've trained you to be wise. Think about it. They didn't have the New <clears throat> Testament then. They had the Old Testament. Is that a spirit? Is that more just a, uh, what's the word? That's not truth from his infancy. It's more of a comparison to his spiritual infancy. Is that what he's referencing? Well, like when you're young. No, you're his just... grandma. We read read in the rest of another part of the Bible that his I think it was his grandma and his mom. Oh, okay. Trained him in the Word of God. Gotcha. Right. That's why Timothy was special. He was a Greek. His dad was a Greek. That's why he had to cut off his foreskin, right? So here's this Greek who's been trained in the Scriptures, the Judea, the Old Testament about Jesus Christ since he was a baby. And then Paul takes him on a mission, knows that he won't be effective with the Jews. Imagine being, that wasn't the gospel that you had to have your foreskin cut off, but it would help. Timothy went over the Jewish nation. Pretty uh, committed guy, this. Right? All right, Josh, come here. Whoosh, you know, All right, let's rough, get right? Bible study started. He was thoroughly equipped. All right. Speak. All scriptures God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. See, God wants you to be thoroughly equipped. That's pretty cool. God has a heart. And so what he did is he wrote the scriptures to help you be thoroughly equipped. Not only does he want a relationship with you, not only does he love talking to you, not only does he love, you know, having a relationship with you, not only does he want you to be saved, but he, on top of that, he wants you to be thoroughly equipped. I think about my kids. They're pretty thoroughly equipped in the scriptures already, right? Imagine that from infancy, having that. That'd be awesome, right? Helps you so much in life if we just listen to the word of God. Any questions on that? No, I just thought. <clears throat> Go. So, I mean, thoroughly to, the, to that point, it's like trying to do any job with the wrong tools is going to becomes the worst. frustrating or hard. <clears throat> so learning how to use the scripture as a tool, that's right, and properly use it, is only going to make the journey easier. Well, when we have like, you know, you know, think about war, we think about not being thoroughly equipped, imagine going to the war, not being thoroughly equipped, right? Imagine doing your job, not being thoroughly equipped, you know, imagine being married and not being thoroughly equipped. It, it's amazing how, in, in being a father, I think about what you're going through right now and when I was going through it. What I held on to was the book of Hosea. 
that God feels what we felt. The time and time again, right? And yet God knows exactly what we're feeling, right? And on even a higher level. All right, 2 Peter chapter 1. It's interesting here. In verse 12, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. Peter is an old man now. He's about to die. Did you say 2 Peter? 2 Peter chapter 1. He's about to die. He's an old man. And think about what he wants to leave behind for his people. It says, verse 12, So I always remind you of these things, even though you know them, and are firmly established in truth. Don't be, don't be, when you get older and you get smart in the Bible, one of the things that you can get is like, oh, I've heard this a million times, right? We need to hear it a million times, okay? He says, even though you, you know them and are firmly established in the truth, I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in this tent, this body. That's what old people do, right? Because I know and I will soon put aside. When old people talk to you and they're in your life, do they talk to you about, you know, math and, you know, uh, how to carve wood. No, they teach you what's top priority, right? That's what Peter does. Soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made it clear to me. He knows he's going to be hanged upside down. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. That's why he's writing it down. We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we were told, when we told you about the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For we received honor and glory from the God and the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love and whom I well please. That's during Jesus' baptism, right? He was eyewitness of it. Imagine being there and being able to see it. He says, Verse 19, and we have the word of the prophets made more certain, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day's dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. What is he talking about here? He's talking about the scriptures, the prophets, the Old Testament, right? He says, above all. Now there's that, that phrase again. What did Paul, or Paul say to Timothy to tell him what? That's what old men do, above all, right? Summation. Get this right. Just like Paul told Timothy, the scriptures, talked about the scriptures, he says, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For the prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Peter, at the end of his life, wants to impress upon his, his, the disciples of Jesus, the people in his church. He's an elder now, right? And his main thing out of his the end of his life is look, remember. It even goes on and talks about there's going to be false teachers. Scripture, the, the holy the, the prophets were carried along. By the Holy Spirit. It's as if the prophets were the pen and the Holy Spirit was the hand. Look at me. The, Holy, the prophets were the pen and the Holy Spirit was the hand. And they were writing down the scriptures from the Holy Spirit. And he says, this is how we can prove the Bible is the word of God. He says, because no scripture had its origin in the will of man. So origin equals creation. It wasn't established. It, it wasn't devised by the will of man. How can we know that? We have to, we know that the Bible had to be from some other being than mankind. Why? What are the top three things that are the will of man? If we went down to Yavapai Community College, <laughs> sex, power, money. That's right. <laughs> Definitely be selfish. Sex. That's why pornography is so big. Power. 
and money. It's pretty easy, right? Men aren't complicated. What does the Bible say about sex? One man, one woman, right? You married? Keep the bed holy, right? Keep the bedroom holy. Don't lust after other women, right? You commit adultery in your heart. What's the Book of Mormon say about women? Or the books that the Mormon church allows? What does Brigham Young say? Have plenty of them. Many wives as you can. Who is that service? That teaching. I just want to bang as many chicks as I can. That's exactly what the Book of Mormon is teaching. What does the Quran say about women? And I'm with the sticks, Mormon. No, about about sex. Oh. <laughs> You're gonna get 72 virgins when you die, right? I mean, what kind of God would give that to you? That's that's a man saying that you're going to get all these women, these virgins, that just to have sex with. And who creates that? It's not in the origin of... Is That's in the origin of man. What about the poor virgins? Yeah. <laughs> Power. What does the Bible say? Which of least, them? yeah. It says, do not lord it over them like the Gentiles do, right? But give up your cloak. Take care of them. Serve them, right? The Quran, what does it say about power? Let's start with the Book of Mormon. What does the Book of Mormon say about power? It says you're going to become gods. Mm-hmm. That when you die, you'll become gods. Well, of course a man wrote that. Men want to be gods. They want to be treated like gods. They want to feel like gods. That's why the Book of Mormon appeals to men. The Quran, Josh already mentioned it. You can beat your wife with a stick as thick as your thumb. I got a pretty thick thumb. Genie's in trouble, right? <laughs> That's all about controlling women, right? And we see that throughout the Middle East. It's all about controlling women. It's not the origin of God. What does the Bible say about power with your wife? Lay down your life for your wife as Christ laid down his life for the church. What man would ever write, write that? Hey, guys. Especially in the context of back then. Yeah, too. especially back then, right? Hey, guys, we really need to lay down our life for our wife, right? Men would be like, no, we take advantage of our wife. We don't appreciate our wife. They need to submit to us and do what we want. We, that's what human man wants. But God, obviously the book of Bible was written differently. It had to be a, have a different writer. <clears throat> Money. The Bible says, use your money to win over outsiders. In the Book in the book of Mormon, the Mormon church, I've seen it many times, where money is used to manipulate people to stay in the church, to lord it over them, especially young people, that you will be kicked out of the family and the will as far as money if you don't stay in the church. It's used all the time. Okay? See, that's why we know the Bible is the Word of God. Exactly. Yeah. Can you throw some of your scripture references? <clears throat> Not right now, but just post facto. Yeah. For in the Bible, where you specifically yeah, point yeah. to in the Bible, where right. it gives those things up. So, so this is an important thing to study with every man that you study with and your kids. Why? Because they'll be bombarded by everybody. Yeah, that the Book of Mormon, because when you get with the Mormons, wow, they seem so amazing. They serve, they do all this stuff for you and all this stuff. But the fact is, is that their doctrine is obviously written by man, and it gets worse. I mean, when you start digging deeper, the Book of Mormon is mostly a copy of the, the Old Testament, so it's not as bad. But it's all the other books that they have. They have four other books that are just evil. Mary was banged by God. You know what I mean? That's a they believe, you know, Jesus wasn't God, right? Things like that. Any questions? To the, to the, to the, 